Well, what are some other rare complications? Well, infection is a rare complication, but it can be a serious one. I'm happy to say that in over 40,000 cases, I haven't had one case of even the most mild infection postoperatively. And I believe this is in part because we have a very strict preoperative infection control regimen consisting of the eyelid scrubs and the use of preoperative antibiotic drops. And intraoperatively, we use antibiotics, carefully prepare the eye with betadine, iodine, sterile solution, and use sterile technique. But what if an infection occurs? And this can be potentially serious and can cause scarring on the surface of the cornea such that the patient is obligated to use a contact lens in order to achieve their very best vision or, in a very unusual case, undergo a corneal transplant operation in order to achieve their best vision. Now again, I'm happy to say in over 40,000 cases, I have not had one case of infection. Another exceedingly rare complication which can lead to visual loss is the closure of a blood vessel in the back of the eye such that it starves the retina for oxygen for a few moments and can result in loss of vision. Now, not only have I not had a case of this, I have actually not even heard of a case happening, but it is a potential complication and because of its possibility, I wanted you to know about it, but it's important to realize that it is exceedingly rare. Now, what about a condition called keratoconus? Keratoconus is an unusual but a naturally occurring thinning condition of the eye where the cornea becomes very steep and very thin and protrudes, kind of like an ice cream cone comes to a point rather than a smooth, rounded surface, say the bottom of a soup bowl. Normally, the curvature of the cornea is kind of like not exactly, but kind of like the bottom of a, of a rounded soup bowl. But patients with keratoconus, the cornea can actually come to a point, like the tip of a mountain or the tip of an ice cream cone. Now, as I said before, this can naturally occur. It generally starts in the teens and can progress through tw the 20s or 30s. Now, we do sophisticated mapping techniques, including the use of the Pentacam, uh, to determine preoperatively whether a patient has keratoconus. Obviously, if we detect keratoconus, we will not be performing your LASIK. But sometimes, a person may have the diathesis to develop keratoconus, but we can't detect it yet with any of our current scanning techniques. So then we perform the laser, and within a year or two or five, they actually develop keratoconus. Now, in some cases, we have actually precipitated that keratoconus with the laser procedure. And in other cases, it would have developed anyway, whether we did the LASIK or not. And it's very hard to tell the difference. But you're in actually the best of hands with my center in that we not only have the latest diagnostic equipment to help us determine whether you have underlying keratoconus, but I am a corneal transplant specialist, and I am well trained in the recognition and the treatment of keratoconus. Now if keratoconus develops after LASIK surgery, and I have about four cases of keratoconus that have developed in the 40,000 cases that I've done, about one in 10,000, and those patients are wearing a hard contact lens to achieve their best vision. But in some cases, and I have no cases of this, but in some cases, the keratoconus can become so severe after LASIK that it requires a corneal transplant operation to restore decent vision. 